Okay, seems to be recording. Yes. Ah, perfect. Session? Yes, okay, recording we are now. recording now. Thank you, Rob. Okay, so welcome everybody to our very first session of this Realizing the EOSC event. So I'm really excited to be your chair of this opening session of our big event. So um, yeah, we are really excited um, that all of you signed up for this and are joining us this morning um, for the kickoff of what will be a very long and very um, colorful event with a lot of interesting talks. So this event is a uh, um, co-organized co co by three um, EOS projects, EOS Cup, Freya and Shock. And I'm my, my name is Ricarda Brockmann and I'm from Dance, but I'm also involved in the Freya project as um, lead of the communication and engagement work package. And together with colleagues from EOS Cup and Shock, and I want to mention in particular Rob Carillo and Marike Willems, uh, we have been organizing this, uh, this event together. And this is, um, yeah, you're now watching the opening session where we'll um, give you a bit of an introduction to the event. And we also have two interesting keynote speakers, Lina uh, Maria Morani from the European Commission and Ingrid Dille from Danz, who will give us a bit of a broader perspective on what realizing the EOSC means in different contexts. And um, yeah, we hope this is a nice kickoff for, for our event where we'll have lots of time for exchange and discussion. And we also have uh, Rondeka with us who will be uh, showing us the EOSC Expo today. And he is um, part of the EOS Executive Board and also the coordinator of SHOCK. So a little bit of background about our event today. As I already mentioned, it's organized by three projects, EOS Cup, Freya and SHOCK, because we thought it would be a great opportunity for us to join forces um, and have this event together online. Um, with everybody to just look at what, what we can do as projects together to realize the European Open Science Cloud. And it has um, become a three and a half day event with a lot of different uh, topics and, and themes. We have uh, so far more than 450 registered participants from 45 um, countries. So we were really excited that so many people showed interest in the sessions and in this event. And also that so many different um, nationalities have signed up. I think this is really one of the advantages of digital events that we can also um, achieve a broader coverage than we might have maybe if we would have been in Amsterdam. Although of course, um, we would have loved to meet you all in person, but um, the one advantage is that more people from more countries can join us uh, online. We have um, more than 30 booths uh, of projects of which we will hear more a little bit more in a while. And we have 30 different sessions that you can join uh, throughout these three and a half days to um, learn about the different projects, what has been done in the EOS, and also how we are collaborating across um, uh, disciplines, across themes to uh, realize um, the EOS. Just a couple of housekeeping rules. So all sessions will be recorded and will be made available afterwards through a YouTube channel. So this will be shared with you and um, you can rewatch sessions later, which I think is really nice. Uh, we would ask everybody to stay muted and keep your video off during presentations. You will uh, notice that some of the sessions like this uh, main session are in webinar mode, where you have a little bit less opportunity to um, uh, have your video turned on, but we also have some sessions that are that are more interactive meetings and there we also would ask you to stay muted, keep your video off during presentations and you can always ask questions in the chat or through the Q&A. So we would also encourage everybody to do that today if you have questions about um, anything that is presented in this opening session or for our keynote speakers, you can do so in the uh, chat and the question and answer section. And if you have um, any problems, you can visit the information desk in the main conference. You can also obviously ask us in the chat, but if you have um, severe technical problems or any other issues, you can always visit the information desk and they will help you there and show you um, how you can optimally enjoy this, this event. Then a little bit about the, the program. So as I already mentioned, we have um, three and a half days of program and these days are, um, clustered uh, amongst specific themes that we wanted to cover with this event. So um, today we'll start off with a day um, on policy and governance. And then tomorrow we have uh, the theme technology and infrastructure. 
And then the third day will focus on training and community building. And our last day is on sustainability and the future of the EOSC. So we really try to cover all of the different aspects that are important um, for us projects and also to realize the EOSC together. Uh, you can find the full agenda on um, the, the projects or the, the conference website. And we also have a Zenodo community page where we ask all presenters to upload their slides and make them available to you. So if you're interested to learn more about particular sessions and look at the materials, then you can uh, have an, a look at our Zenodo community page. And a little bit more about today's program. So you are now watching the welcome and our opening keynotes, which will kick off this event. And then we have from 11 onwards, we have more thematic uh, sessions. So we start with the discovery marketplace for the EOSC. And then um, after lunch, we have a couple of breakout sessions on the place of pits in EOSC, EOSC core and the service management system and fair data citations for social sciences and humanities. And then uh, after a short break, there are again, some breakout sessions um, also themed in our service demonstrators. So you can learn this afternoon about pit graph services and the shock innovation in innovations in data production. And then the last sessions will be about implementing data principles and ethnic and man migrant minority service industry and on the shock innovations in data production. So this is the, the sessions that you can, can join today. And um, yeah, we'll hope that you enjoy uh, today and also the rest of the this uh, this week's program. Um, there's a lot to discover, and yeah, we're really excited that we were able to put this this program together. And then our conference um, also has a couple of special features. So we really tried to uh, design something for you that would break you away from the Zoom fatigue that people might be experiencing now working from home. So in this conference, you can find the, the networking lounge where you can network with people. We also have a special EOSC project expo where other projects have the opportunity to showcase their work and you can interact with people. And uh, Rondeka in a minute will talk a little bit more about, about this expo um, and what you can see there. And then there's also a scavenger hunch and a leaderboard uh, where you can win prizes. So there are some uh, hidden features on this conference that you can find. And also visiting project booth will give you um, give you points and will award um, the, the most active participants at the end of this, um, this week. So the winners um, as well for the project expo, but also for this scavenger hunt will be announced in the closing session that will be happening on the 19th. So yeah, this I think will be a really exciting conference with lots of different features where you can explore and learn about um, the different projects involved in the EOSC and what they do to realize this big infrastructure together. And just to give you an overview of what we will be doing in this opening session. So I will, um, after this, show you a brief introduction video that our project coordinators from EOS Cup, Freya and Shock have been making for you to welcome you to this, um, to this event. And then we will have an introduction to the EOSC Expo by Ron Decker. And then we'll have um, two keynotes, as I mentioned already at the very beginning. So we have Nina Maria Murani from the European Commission with us, and also Ingrid Dille from Danz, who will be uh, giving keynotes on their perspective on uh, realizing the EOSC. So this is uh, my brief introduction to the, uh, to the event, and I will now um, share the video of the project coordinators with you. Just give me a second. So I hope you will now be able to see the video. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tiziana Ferrari. I'm the coordinator of the Oscabe project. And on behalf of every member of our consortium, as well as Freya and Shock, we are very glad to have you in this event in a format uh, which is virtual. I'm here in Italy, in my garden, in quarantine, and it was our greatest desire to meet all of you physically in Amsterdam. 
Unfortunately, this is not possible this year. Nevertheless, we hope that uh, this virtual event is bringing a lot of content to you. I'm Simon Lambert, the coordinator of the Freya project. And on behalf of the entire project team, I'd like to welcome you to this online event entitled Realising the Open European Open Science Cloud, jointly organised with our fellow projects, EOSC Hub and Shock. The Freya project is soon coming to an end, and this event is a great opportunity to sum up our achievements and to look to the future. I'm the coordinator of Shock which is the Social Science and Humanities Open Cloud. It's an EC cluster project uh, consisting of uh, almost 50 partners. In these uh, three days, you will learn about how these three key projects have been contributing to the implementation of the European Open Science Cloud, its policies and its technical services. You will learn about the EOSC core, major developments from EOSC Hub, the Freya project and uh, SHOCK but also about horizontal services coming from Indigo, UDAT and EGI with thematic services for social sciences and humanities. Over the last three years, the Freya project has been advancing the infrastructure for persistent identifiers, which is an important foundation for the European Open Science Cloud and the global e-infrastructure. Persistent identifiers, or PIDs, are essential for FAIR data, but it is not only data sets and publications that need PIDs, but all kinds of other entities in the research field, including human beings, that is the researchers ourselves, scientific instruments, research organizations, and so on. In Freya, we have been developing our vision of the PID graph into reality through core infrastructure and exciting pilot applications showing the vision implemented in a variety of scientific domains. What we want to accomplish with, uh, with SHOCK is the integration of social sciences and humanities into EOSC. And that, and that contains of data and software, but also tools and services. And last but not least, training, because infrastructures is not about machines only, it's about people. Infrastructures is to bringing together machines and people. And especially I think for social science and humanities, we deal with quality of these data and tools and the software and we want to provide trust into the system because each platform drives on trust. I'm looking forward to this event not only as a chance to showcase the results of the Freya project but also along with EOSC Hub and Shock to show how we are assembling the building blocks of the European Open Science Cloud and putting them into use for the benefit of communities of researchers. But we will not only focus on the past, we will also look to the future in terms of sustainability of what is being developed and continuing engagement with communities. I hope you enjoy the coming days. Within the data clusters like SHOCK uh, and also the other ones, we already deal with providing services to the research communities. For me, the value added of EOSC is to work on cross-disciplinary uh, tools, um, combining data from different disciplines to break down the silos. And it's also about working together with e-infrastructures. And for me, it's very important that we bring in the researchers because we are building the the, the EOSC for the researchers. So let's pay attention to what researchers want and need, and we are the serving organization. We hope that this event will be interactive and we look forward to an engaged discussion with you. So again, welcome to this event from all of us. Yes, so this was the welcome message from our coordinator. Webinar. Oh. Okay, sorry about that. There was some technical problems with my with my screen. Um, so this was the welcome message from our coordinators. And now I would like to give uh, the floor to Ron Decker, who is going to show you or talk to you a little bit about the, the EOSC Expo. Uh, thank you, Ricardo.
yes, welcome to the EOS Project Expo, which is uh, part of this conference. And I think the, this expo is, is the first virtual exhibition um, showcasing EOSC initiatives and, uh, and projects. And I think we have a live connection now to the, to the expo hall. Um, it is meant as a platform for knowledge exchange. And as Ricarda said, it's over 30, uh, 30 boots. Uh, you can you can visit these booths, you can have um, um, bilateral talks, you can enter group chats. And as this is a virtual one, we were free to choose the background. So instead of the dark clouds of Amsterdam and some rainy weather, uh, we chose for Miami, I think it is, uh, with the palm trees, not in Amsterdam, but in, the, in Florida. Um, and as you can see, many, many booths, many participants, and you can uh, also collect videos, you can collect uh, flyers, brochures, and collect them in your own virtual bag. Um, so I want to invite you to do, uh, to, to pay a visit to this uh, expo, to talk with the, the, the people at the booths, to talk with uh, your colleagues. Um, you can visit this uh, during breaks, during uh, lunches. And um, it's, um, as I said, it's, it's a way to dynamically interact with all the participants and to get more information about the projects. And well, I hereby officially open this expo, but um, I do ask you to wait a little bit till after the keynotes by, by Lina and Ingrid, uh, but then I hope to see you in either the lounge or at one of the booths. So thank you very much and back to Ricarda. Thank you, Ron, and I'm also already really excited to go and watch all of the different expos. But now I'm even more excited to announce our first keynote speaker, which is by Lina Murani, and she is the deputy head of unit at the e-infrastructure and science cloud of the DG Connect of the European Commission. And she has over 20 years of experience in serving the European uh, institutions, and she has worked in several sectors of the EU technology research and innovation, including learning technologies, digital libraries and digital preservation. And her academic background is in international and European politics. So we're really excited for her to be here today and to uh, give her a take on uh, what it means and what we need to realize the EOSC. So I'm, uh, I'm giving the floor now to Lina Murani. Thank you very much, uh, Ricarda and Ron. Uh, thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor. I will uh, start uh, to share. Just wait a second. I'll share the right screen with you. I assume that you should be able to see it now. Is that correct? Yes, this is the presentation mode. Sorry. Yes, very yeah. good. Let me just put, uh, I have just hide some things here so that they don't start showing on top of the... Okay, very good. So I'll Now just... it's no longer in presentation Yeah, I, I'll put it back, I'll put it back. It's okay. uh, just that I have some... Yeah. Okay, very good. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, for inviting me. As I said, I was already properly introduced. So I'm happy to be in this uh, this conference, uh, and I'm happy to to see that it has the social sciences uh, uh, angle. As you as you know, I've been working in technology research for a long time, but coming also from a social political background. So I always find it interesting when this 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 kind of dimensions start to come in in this area of e infrastructures, which is often very technology heavy. If I if I might say so. So uh, without further ado, I thought I'd give you a little bit of an overview of both uh, of, even though Ron is here with you, he's the member of the executive board of EOSC, you know, of course, you've been all following the governance uh, a little bit and uh, probably from your angles, I just tried to give you a little bit of an overview of where we stand now. 
from both from the perspective of uh, of uh, of the governance and and also from the from the, the the project point of view i'm actually very thrilled to see the exhibition hall because this is fantastic so it's really really one of these uh, moments that we have when we actually start discovering these tools and understand that these are actually available even for later when we go back to analog mode so to say it's good to have probably an overlay with this video and, and with virtual uh, conference mode because this of course as we say uh, allows much more people to 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 join and the knowledge sharing is of course greater so where do we stand at the end of 2020? Um, we have our Horizon 2020 projects coming to an end, uh, including Freya and ELSC Hub, which are both from the Connect portfolio. You know that we share the ELSC file with the DDRTD. Um, and, and, and whilst the uh, shock project is, is from the DDRTD uh, portfolio, it's not really important for you to know where it comes from, but it's important to see that, uh, that these are projects are also naturally finding each other and that, uh, and that, uh, and that there is a collaboration uh, we have still the last Horizon 2020 projects to start, uh, the infra ASOC 03 and 07 calls that you might be, of course, aware of. Um, I go a little bit further to that uh, later. Uh, so then we come to the end of Horizon 2020 investment on ASOC, which is uh, easily over uh, 180 million, I think we've put all together uh, into it. And then we are getting into the new mode of, uh, of Horizon Europe, of, uh, which is more uh, guided uh, to, to the partnership, uh, which is being set up. But but I'll also give a few more pointers to that later. So the, the commission currently, as uh, I, I told, uh, the commission together with the Research Infrastructures Committee uh, is, is preparing the next work program for the Horizon Europe. Uh, and we're very much, of course, trying to align. And now this time, um, uh, our work uh, with uh, the Strategic Region and Innovation Agenda and the accompanying multi-annual roadmap, which is the two-year sort of version of what's happening next, let's say more granular mode of the, of the Research and Innovation Agenda, and try to take as much as possible into account uh, this development as they go parallel. Uh, the EOSC the Association has been, has been established. The first constitutive meeting is in, 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 in December. So we're looking very closely at that as well, of course, to see uh, how, how the association kicks, uh, kicks off. Uh, and therefore, uh, that will close then the interim governance phase, which was set up for two years at the end of this year. So the mandate of the current executive uh, governance board and, uh, and the current uh, setup is, is coming to an end. And finally, um, the work of the EOS executive board working groups is also, but that's actually, as you know, where the work is being done, uh, is, is being finalized. So those are the six, uh, six working groups um, uh, and, um, and, and, and their task forces. So, uh, just uh, just a little pointer uh, to, with the fair working group because I know that this is uh, of interest of all the participants of this, this project. You've probably been following it close. You've probably been participating in the working group. Just to tell you that these are now the the first sort of key documents that are coming out: a report on fair practice, um, uh, a report on a, on a PID policy. Uh, metrics and certification work has been has been advanced, and uh, and then there is the document on interoperability, which is uh, this as together with the PAD policy documents, the both architecture and fair working groups have been working on this. They all find you know, you always you find them just by googling, or you find them through the secretariat uh, website if you are interested, and you probably already know about them. But just thought I mentioned them briefly. Uh, this is a bit of uh, illisible uh, of a slide, but I leave it, of course, with you so that you can go afterwards because it's a uh, courtesy again to my colleagues at DGRTD who have actually compiled this file. So it shows you the the, um, the timeline of the EOS projects as they've been uh, funded from 2015 onwards. So you see that we start from Open Air 2020, ARC, RDA Europe, Europe, as they were funded in 2015. And the last ones that we have here in this slide are the projects uh, that came from the previous uh, call of ours, which was the service call. Uh, and they are coming to an end in 2023. Uh, as you see, the timeline goes up until 2023. What is not included in this yet is the next uh, projects that are coming from the 03 and 07. They are formally still in the grant agreement preparation stage, uh, but they will be added to it. So what I wanted to say with this slide is that, you know, these projects that have been greatly, of course, contributing to realizing EOSC, uh, uh, they started already 2015. The work has been ongoing. And then uh, you see that how much they're actually coming to uh, 
coming to uh, to to sort of overlap with the Horizon Europe, which is uh, start to Horizon Europe projects are starting um, as of uh, 2022. The first calls are going to be in 2021, so there's going to be a, an overlap and uh, and sort of continuation of these projects uh, over to the next program. Um, these are the ones that are currently under, uh, that were selected from the 03 and 07 um, uh, calls. Uh, we have uh, four projects coming out, no, sorry, five projects coming out from the 07. This is, of course, about the increasing the service offer. We got EGIAs, uh, we got DICE on data services, we can open air uh, next version of it. Uh, and we have two projects that are about, the, if you remember in the work program, there were these six uh, subtopics. C-Scale and Reliance, which are both going to be additional resource enabling services, uh, focusing, if I remember correctly, on the on the on the Copernicus uh, data. Um, and these will we uh, will start at all at a certain point in the beginning of next year. And then we have the big uh, Infrius 03 project, which is currently under negotiations, which would be the follow sort of the bridge between the current program and the governance and the next projects that will be launched as following the the work program of Horizon uh, Europe, which will be be published uh, at the uh, beginning of next year. Um, I would like to say a few words about Horizon Europe uh, current uh, work. Uh, most probably you as well have been aware of through your members of the Research Infrastructures Committee and other people who are uh, probably involved of, of how this work program is evolving. It has gone through several iterations already through the Research Infrastructures Committee. So there are five destinations. As you know, this is the new vocabulary of the, of the, of the Horizon Europe throughout, not only in Pillar 1, where the research infrastructures and e-infrastructures reside. Uh, so we have five destinations. First one is about developing, consolidating and optimizing European research infrastructures to maintain global leadership. So this is the, the, the part uh, mainly um, uh, uh, directed or, uh, or, 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 or managed by DGRTD, of course. Uh, destination two is where all things EOSC will happen, let's say in a, in a grosso modo. Uh, this destination called Enabling Operational Open and Fair EOSC Ecosystem, which I think you have three important keywords there, operational, open and fair, uh, are having, I'm sure you soon, uh, what are the topics that are being planned under each. Uh, the destination three, uh, which is about the research infrastructure services to support health research, accelerate the green digital transformation, advanced frontier knowledge is, 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 is the next one. And then we have destination four, where we have next generation scientific instruments, tools, methods, and advanced digital solutions which is a bit more bottom up uh, uh, approach uh, destination it's more or more really on the on the new technologies and new new instrumentation uh, rather than, than than services and um, and the destination five then is about the network connectivity as you know uh, currently uh, operated by Jean in Europe and, uh, and outside so these are the five destinations this is the topics overview of the destination two, which is of interest, I think, for this community in particular. And I wanted to show this uh, uh, just to make uh, clear how overarching the concept of FAIR is going to be in the next work program. So on the left-hand side, you can see the SRIA, Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda Objectives. The SRIA is available, as you know, it's now going through the next, uh, next the iteration is that the public version is the 0 0.8 uh, version, which is also available uh, online. And uh, that 0 0.8, 0 0.8 means that is about 80% uh, complete. Uh, it's already, obviously it was published a few weeks ago and it's already gone through in the next, uh, it's, it's currently being revised to be the 0 0.9 uh, version. But just to show you like the three big objectives for EOSC as being uh, highlighted in ISRIA, this is how they will translate into topics into the course because the modus operandi uh, for the Horizon Europe over EOSC is that we'll follow uh, quite closely the, the, um, the research agenda suggested by the stakeholders, notably by the EOSC Association and its members. And, and try to model the work program uh, to, to address those, uh, those topics that are highlighted. So this is actually a key document for us to guide, you know, as, as you know, in many areas of Horizon Europe uh, on Horizon 2020, there are research agendas that are behind the calls. And until now we haven't really had one for ESC. So we're very happy to do that. And to have it, of course, to have this sort of more structured dialogue through this co-program partnership that is, uh, that is uh, EOSC uh, 
um, uh, uh, sort of which is the the, 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 the base of, of our cooperation. So you can see there is uh, of course uh, work on, on, on skills, there is uh, calls on, on uh, support on, on coordination of the partnership in general. Uh, what I would like to highlight is there is the, the both the deploying corp components of FAIR where well, all this work on PIDs for example will continue. Um, and I would like to highlight also the three RIAs, which are of course very much lined with uh, with the missions. Uh, uh, as you know, Horizon Europe has also uh, underlying. Uh, you know, there are these these key missions that is supposed to respond to. So also here, um, the, the the fair uh, 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 approach to realizing these missions has been taken into account. Um, it, I would like to say a few words about, I know I have 15 minutes, so uh, I would like to say a few words about the strategies that the Commission has put up, especially from a Connect perspective recently. So you have the digital strategy, which is the overall digital strategy for Europe, uh, not only obviously for this area. Uh, we have an industrial policy strategy, which is key because, uh, because uh, this is uh, clearly, you know, the digital strategy and industrial policy strategy go hand in hand, but they are separate, of course. But the these are the, the two key big documents that have been uh, coming out, plus not to forget, of course, the European Green Deal, uh, which even after the COVID-19 crisis, the Commission sort of reoriented its priorities and a new sort of the twin objective of the current Commission post uh, of, let's say, taking into account all this upheaval that has been uh, has perhaps, of course, affected uh, also all these priorities due to COVID is that uh, it's a twin digital and green strategy. So those two are the key pointers uh, for the Commission to, 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 to make Europe recover from uh, this crisis. And uh, not to forget, of course, the European HPC strategy. It's very, this is of course, sort of the other side of the coin at the, at the infrastructures and the, and the work we do at, the, at Connect. And, and all the work done for the Euro HPC and the different uh, different big supercomputers that are being procured, etc. Uh, and then not to forget the data strategy, which is uh, of course uh, a lot of regulatory as well, but it's also sort of the underpinning all these other ones. And I, can, I would like to show you an example of, of how this actually is underpinning many activities, not only of, from our perspective in EOS, because in my unit, well, I can I can just show you a little bit more about the data strategy. I have this extra slide because this is probably closest to this audience as well in terms of data. So the aim of the data strategy is to have a single market for data where data can flow within EU and across sectors for the benefit of all. It's based on European rules, in particular in privacy and data protection, as based as well as the competition law. As you know, that's an exclusive competence of European Union. Uh, that all this is fully respected. The rules of access and use of data is fair, practical and clear. And it's very interesting because in this concept, the fair is probably not used in terms of fair as in this conference, but the word fair is, is, is of course throughout, goes through the process. And it's very interesting because when you talk about the European data spaces, they specifically refer to the fair as we understand, findable, accessible, reusable and, and, and uh, um, well, in, in, interoperable and reusable. Uh, that's where it's explicitly mentioned that one of the ways to actually have these common European data spaces uh, available and this cross sort of uh, filtering of data and accessibility of the data is based uh, on, on, on FAIR. And um, and so this is very important because, of course, you know that data strategy, of course, very much also focus on industry and SMEs, on public data space assets, on, 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 on data. This is commonly available uh, through uh, Europe uh, of through different databases uh, in Europe. But, um, but it doesn't exclude, uh, of course, research data. And it's very important to also notice that there is the Open Data Directive, which has been already adopted and that member states are going to transpose this data directive into uh, the national legislation, as is the case always when you talk about the directive. It gives the directions how the member states should uh, change their national legislation. Uh, one, uh, so that, that deadline for transposing the directive is next June. So June 2021, and as you know, those who have been looking at it, this has also research data in it. So according to the Open Data Directive, the member states should transpose their national legislation so that also the research data, which is publicly funded, should be open. So that's quite important and, uh, and probably something to think about. I'm sure that the, the, the real repercussions of this will, uh, will start to show later, but all these efforts towards having more fair data available, uh, it's, 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 it's really key. 
uh, across our, 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 our policies and a part, uh, across our strategies, which uh, of course in, 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 in it will, will be a focus of EOS, but also many of the other initiatives that the Commission is undertaking. So I would like to just in this case, uh, in my unit uh, uh, Connect C1, we have several big sort of uh, files and another file is called Destination Earth. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it is uh, a new initiative uh, from the Green Deal to develop a very high position digital model of the Earth to monitor and simulate natural and human activity. Uh, it's based on Green Deal and digital strategy, but also uh, be a key component of the European strategy of the data and the European green, uh, the green data space, uh, which is mentioned in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the data strategy. The aim of it is very simply to unlock the potential of digital model modeling of the Earth's physical resources related phenomena. So we'll build a core platform uh, uh, which will host uh, thematic digital twins that will then give access to various services. Uh, I'm talking about this in this concept because um, it's very important to understand that this destination Earth, it's, it's the first two digital twins that will, all of this will be developed from the Commission side from the Digital Europe program, which is another one than Horizon of Europe, as you know, and, uh, and it's more of a deployment program than research program. So this is going to be something that we hope in about 30 months of time when we finish, we're going to have something readily doable to, to start to use already uh, at, at European level. Uh, it's very important to understand that of all the other digital twins, developments that you find throughout the Horizon Europe work program who are already existing, who are the manufacturing, the service, you know, there are a lot of industries using them already. The aim of the destination Earth is not just to do a physical replica of physical systems, for example, on earthquakes, on flooding, on, uh, on extreme events, or even looking at the climate change adaptation in areas of food production and, uh, and, and water supply, but is also to link it to the socioeconomic data. And I think this is where this community uh, again comes into play that, that there's going to be huge need for uh, fair uh, uh, social economic data that can be used, can be combined with all this, uh, this data, which is uh, traditionally, of course, very much uh, what's professional use oriented for climate scientists, for people who work in these areas, because the Destination Earth Initiative is something which is going to be gradually opened up even to the, to the citizen level. So, of course, we start with existing systems that are currently being run and operated by the key organizations in Europe called, uh, for example, European Space Agency, CMWF and AOMETSAT. But from then onwards, the aim is that you can bring your own data sets, you can play around the system, you can do your own modeling and you can use it for So this is sort of uh, our big aim. So I just wanted to highlight this and bring you a little bit away from the comfort zone of OVEOSC to think that where else is the socioeconomic data uh, uh, important. And, and, and this is one area where we're looking at, uh, at, at the in the future. So this is where I, what I have for you. Oh, this is a very nice slide of a colleague of mine is uh, when he talks about uh, Mr. Krieg Kirchsteiger, who was, I think, addressing the EOSCAP conference uh, earlier. Uh, so the aim of the Destination Earth is to close all the white spots and visualize the borders of ignorance. And without going too much into detail what this means in terms of Destination Earth, I think it's a good closing statement for my, for my presentation and also for this conference that we have to all recognize that we are just in the beginning. We are aiming to close all the white spots in the, in the map of, uh, of, of, of Europe and, and world which concerns open and fair data uh, to be able to visualize not only what we will know, but to understand what we don't know. And I think this is the key for starting uh, for any new knowledge to to, to, to be generated and to start. So thank you very much. And I stop sharing my screen here. And, uh, and I don't know what the choreography is, whether we go to the next presentation or if there are questions, but I'm of course here for any further questions. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you very much, Nina. And also thank you for closing off with such a nice statement, which I think can really drive this, this conference. I think it's really nice to see also all of the projects that have been and will contribute to the EOSC. And I think we all really much realize that it's still an effort where we are at the beginning and we can, we can do so much more. So given the time, I would like to move on to our next uh, speaker. But 
if people uh, want to ask questions, you can put them, uh, could put them in the, in the Q&A. But um, looking at the time, I would like to, um, yeah, to go to our next, uh, next keynote speaker, which is uh, Ingrid Dillo. So Ingrid Dillo is Deputy Director of uh, DANCE, the Institute for Permanent Access to Digital Research Resources in the Netherlands. And in this role, she has extensive experience in the area of research data management, uh, fair data, and also the certification of digital repositories, being involved in the establishment of the Core Trust seal. Um, Ingrid is also the project coordinator of the FAIRS FAIR project, which is one of the larger um, EOSCO latest projects bringing together two, 22 different partners to foster fair data practices in Europe. And she has also um, been involved in the RDA as a longtime RDA leader and currently saving, serving as a co-chair of the RDA Council. And she's also been involved um, as a chair and co-chair in a number of RDA groups, including the recent COVID-19 working groups. And she's going to talk about uh, community initiatives that become critical of international data infrastructure. So uh, with that, I would like to give the floor to you, Ingrid. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak this morning. Um, the title of my talk might be a bit provocative, and that is not really my style, but today I want to take the opportunity to throw a little stone in the pond. Um, we are at the start of a festive week this week, um, and I think the conference um, this week will showcase um, in the coming days the many achievements of the three European projects that have contributed heavily also to the realization of the EOSC. And it's great to see that the choice was made to, uh, by these projects to do this in a collaborative way with one co-organized event. And I guess it's in that same spirit of collaboration that I was asked by the organizers to talk about an extraordinary example of community collaboration in the context of the current pandemic. And of course, I'm going to do that. But um, at the same time, I would also like to talk about the challenges around the sustainability of community initiatives. I have been and still am involved in some of them and there are elements that worry me. So let's start with the COVID initiative of the Research Data Alliance and how that came about. Um, here you see a quick overview on the slide. Um, in short, in April, um, we set up a working group as we have many working groups in RDA. Um, a case statement for that working group was written and um, subgroups were created under that, the umbrella of that working group. And that working group produced an output in the form of guidelines and recommendations. So, so far, this sounds like business as usual for those of you who are familiar with RDA procedures and workflows. But it was not business as usual at all for several reasons. The first reason was that this was not a bottom-up um, initiative like we usually have in RDA. This was really a top-down one. This initiative came about because we were asked by the European Commission to create those uh, recommendations and guidelines. A second um, uh, different point was the fact that this was really a fast track working group. Usually working groups work for 12 to 18 months within RDA to produce an output, but this time we had to do it in um, less than three months. What was also different was the amount of people that were involved, and I will get back to that that were really um, a lot more people than um, the usual working groups. And amongst those people, also a new point, we saw a lot of newcomers, people who were not yet part of the RDA community, but joined because of this initiative, people from all over the world. And then of course, like um, everything um, in these days, this was also the first working group that worked completely online without any face-to-face -face meetings. Now you can imagine that doing that with so many people um, in such a short time, a time span was really a very intense and exhausting exercise. And um, you can really say that in those months, um, people worked 24-7 um, on these topics um, around the world in different time zones. But that also created a kind of very special atmosphere in which there was also a room for a lot of excitement and, and inspiration. 
So how did we organize all of this? Let's um, first look a little bit closer to the structure and the people involved. Like I said, it was a fast track working group and we had 600 people um, signing up for this working group, including newcomers from all continents involved. And of those 600 people, um, 165 were really identified as active contributors to the outputs, which is still um, a very sizable amount of people. And those people were split up in eight different subgroups. We had four research areas that we tried to cover, the clinical data, omics data, epidemiology data, and social sciences data. And next to that, we had four groups subgroups who were working on different overarching areas. And you see them here on the screen. There was a group looking at community participation. We had an indi indigenous data group. There was a group that looked at legal and ethical considerations, of course, very important in this context. And finally, there was a group that looked at the research software sharing for data analysis. Those subgroups were led by moderators, and all of these moderators were really experts in the different fields. So how did we coordinate that big bunch of people and all those different groups? Also, that was a very intense process. The working group co-chairs, and we had seven of them, had weekly meetings, usually for the European ones in the evenings and late at night. Um, and next to that, the co-chairs also met on a weekly basis with all of the co-moderated moderators and also with the um, support team that was available from, available from the side of the RDA secretariat. So this was a big group of people meeting every week. And next to that, of course, you had the eight different groups, the subgroups that worked usually in sprints and they met up to three times a week. So you can just imagine the huge amount of meetings that took place um, amongst all of these people in that period of three months. And through all of that work and, and discussion, we managed to get six iterations of the final outputs. And those iterations also comprised open webinars in which the current state of affairs was presented to the outside world and where we could discuss with um, as broad an audience as possible. And we also had um, um, consultation periods where the community could um, come up with comments and questions on the materials produced. Now, in the course of that um, process, a couple of other groups were created because along the way we uh, found, um, well, you know, um, insights progress and um, at a certain point in time we thought that it would be good to create, for example, the Zotero library where we would have all the referenced resources and a special team um, took care of that. Next to that, because we imagined that the, um, the final document would be a huge one, we also had a team working on visualization tools to help navigate the document that we produced. And finally, of course, uh, we set up an editorial team to, do, uh, to edit the final output. So you can imagine that this has been a real precious team in which all of this took place, which was again, exhausting on the one hand, but also very exciting on the other hand. So what did this group of people um, produce? Like I said, there is a huge main document of almost 150 pages that comprises the recommendations and guidelines for data sharing under COVID. To make that more accessible, we produced a four page executive summary, a good infographic, the navigation tools that I mentioned, the Zotero library, and recently, because there are still products um, coming from all of that work, a policy brief was published specially aimed at funders and um, a couple of um, spin-off articles in peer-reviewed um, journals will also um, see the light in the coming months. And we had last, last week also a discussion um, during the RDA plenary on how we are going to continue and maintain all of this work. So here you see um, an overview of the key recommendations that came out of the work. So the, these recommendations are more high level and overarching. 
and aimed primarily at funders and, and policy advisors. And you can see um, that they are all quite high level. Um, so for example, the importance of the provision of legal and ethical uh, frameworks um, to share and protect privacy. Um, there's a lot about fair data and the necessity of having data management plans. The importance of depositing data in uh, trustworthy digital repositories, et cetera. They're high level and, and some may even sound obvious to many of you. But I think it's also important not to forget that very often they are not yet that obvious for others. And sometimes it's also good um, to have a little bit of repetition in that sense. Here you see the other kind, um, end of the spectrum. This is a snapshot um, from um, the omics guidelines for researchers. And you can see that this is a completely different level of granularity. Here, researchers are given very detailed and practical guidance when it comes to data sharing. So this slide shows you a quote from one of the very active newcomers in, in this initiative, Priyanka Pillai from Australia. And she stated that an international initiative such as RDA demonstrates the power of a global community, knowledge and connectivity. RDA was able to bring together a huge amount of people from all over the world who really offered an incredible number of volunteer hours next to their day jobs. And I think um, one of the important elements there were the guiding principles of RDA. They were at the heart of everything that we did and they also uh, were very much included in the design of the process. And I think that way RDA offered neutral and very important community driven um, platform that serves many stakeholders. Now, of course, um, RDA also um, plays a role in the realization of the European Science Cloud and not only in um, the context of the pandemic. The global community driven platform also facilitates, of course, a discussion of relevant technical standards for the different action lines that have been um, defined to build the European Open Science Cloud, like the architecture, the data, services, access. And through the platform, um, international expertise and experience can be incorporated in the development of these standards. And it also works the other way around in a sense that European developments can again be tested in an international environment. RDA outputs, are also being formally endorsed as ICT technical specification in Europe, specifications in Europe. And through that procedure, they can of course play a role in formalizing um, the fifth action line of the EOSC and that is, uh, those are the rules of participation. And finally, RDA also contributed to the governance of EOSC. If you look at the slide, you can see that a lot of the people who are members of um, EOSC working groups are also involved in RDA. And in all of these ways, RDA as a community initiative has become, I think, a quite important pillar on which um, the EOSC is built. Now, RDA is not the only international community initiative that EOSC is relying on. Another example is Core Trust Seal. Cortra Seal is an international community based nonprofit organization and it promotes sustainable and trustworthy data infrastructures. So they offer a, a core certification mechanism for repositories by which the repositories can have their trustworthiness and their long term sustainability assessed. And over the last three years, over 100 repositories obtained um, a seal. And services like these, I think, are a vital part of the infrastructure that is underpinning the EOSC. Cortra Seal supports the creation of a network of trustworthy digital repositories in Europe, Europe that we need to safeguard our data over time. And that network itself is, um, in that sense, another critical pillar under the uh, European Open Science Cloud. Finally, um, I guess, that there is no better example than the persistent identifiers to show the vital importance of international community initiatives for the EOSC. 
the persistence identifiers are really a core component of open science and of the European Open Science Cloud. So I've given you a couple of examples of international community initiatives that really have transformed into critical pieces of data infrastructure, both for Europe and for the world. But what about the sustainability of these initiatives? Let's first go back to RDA. RDA um, has been funded um, right from the start in 2013 by different funders around the globe, um, the National Science Foundation in the US, the Australian government, and last but at least, of course, the European Commission. But when you look closely, um, the large majority of that funding is spent in the regions themselves for community engagement, awareness raising, and a lot of other very important activities. But that means that in practice, only 5% of the total budget that has been spent on RDA really flows to um, the unit, the, the RDA global unit that runs and operates the organization that runs the RDA business that takes care of the um, 100 plus groups that we have um, and, and um, the tools and the website and all the support that needs to be given to all of those um, 11,000 individuals. So that is um, not a lot and that um, makes it um, clear that um, the sustainability of this organization is a bit shaky in that sense. Let's look at Core Trust Seal. You can see that um, there is an administrative fee um, that is asked from repositories of a thousand euro when they get certified and they have that certification for three years. And it's a simple calculation if you know that there are a hundred uh, repositories certified to get an idea of the amount of money that is involved there. And um, Core Trust Seal tries to be a professional organization with a website, with an online tool, with um, a lot of people uh, doing voluntary work. We, own, we have 60 volunteer reviewers there. So this also shows that the sustainability might not be that wonderful. And when we look at the sustainability of the trustworthy digital repositories that they um, certify, there is also reason to worry. Already in 2017, the OECD published a report and in that report, it was stated that data repositories, usually based in local and national research institutions or in, at international bodies, are where the long-term stewardship of research data takes place. So they really are at the foundation of open science. And yet, good data stewardship is very costly and research budgets are, as we know, limited. So the development of sustainable business models for research data repositories needs to be a high priority in all countries. And then the PIT providers. When we look at them, we see that most of them started off again as international community initiatives. And many of them were first solely dependent on project funding or incidental funding. They're trying to move to membership fees, but that is a long and difficult road to take. And um, history has shown that it can go wrong. Um, an example is the Pearl identifier, um, which generated 100, I think 100,000 identifiers and then OCLC that run them lost interest and stopped actively supporting the system. Luckily that was saved by the internet archive, but it, it really shows the vulnerability of, um, of providers like that. So the shaky ground on which all of these initiatives stand, and also the fact that they are often, you know, run on a shoestring and depend on voluntary work, is quite in contrast with the importance of them. And we state over and over again that we need services with long-term trustworthiness. You can see it here in a quote from an RDA Europe report that already dates back to 2014. And we also need these services, of course, to be embedded in global community governance. And we can see that again, if you look at the current um, PIT policy for the EOSC, you can read there that it says PIT service providers should have a public and independently verifiable exit plan that assures continuity of their PITs and PIT services should they cease to operate. So we do think that that is an important point. And we also, of course, want the data 
in the EOSC to be accessible and also accessible for the long term. And for this, we really depend on a network of repositories as a kind of layer around the EOSC. So this importance of trust is also acknowledged in um, around the world, not only in Europe. Here you see a, um, a slide from a, a recent Mentimeter that was held in a session of the RDA plenary around global open research clouds. And you can see that the large majority of the people stated that trust is one of the most important core values um, of um, commons like the uh, European Open Science Cloud. And also, this is an example of an, on a national level. Um, here you see a slide from a recent national workshop in the Netherlands at the EGI conference, where a Dutch audience was asked about the gaps that they see in the Dutch data infrastructure. And here you see sustainable funding as the mostly mentioned gap. So what should we do? There are some initiatives. Um, you might have heard of the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services that started off in 2017 to help secure open science infrastructure. That this is sorely needed is shown by a recent report that was commissioned by Spark Europe on the open science infrastructure landscape in Europe. In this report, um, one of the findings was that those infrastructures are generally run on low resources despite offering a range of services and one third of them start the year with no approved budget. So lack of financial sustainability is clear. The report states that funding agencies and governments and institutions and other funders really need to consider strategies on how to effectively run this risk and important landscape more structurally. They need to make smart choices to invest in um, the things that are essential. And when it comes to pieces of infrastructure, I mentioned the task is maybe even more complicated due to the international nature of those services. Because we know that distributing national funding across borders is usually very difficult, if not impossible. Still, that does not excuse us from trying to find solutions for these issues. And a recent report that was commissioned by the EOS uh, Fair Working Group um, also talks about this. It says that it's very difficult for communities to work without funds on a best effort basis. The development of standards, methodologies and tools take commitment and time, but they are really essential um, for putting fair practicals, uh, principles into practice. And therefore the report also recommends that the development and adoption and the maintenance of community standards, tools and infrastructure needs to be funded. And I believe that we should start that discussion on how we can strengthen the sustainability of these community service providers. And maybe we should start with an analysis of the risks involved and putting the topic on the agenda of fora where the funders meet in an international context like OECD or RDA. We all agree on the importance of these infrastructure components and we've come to realize that their providers might not be as sustainable as we would wish them to be. And now it really is the time to do something about that. And I will stop here because I'm sure that you are all eager um, to get a coffee and explore the exhibition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ingrid, for this interesting uh, talk and also for starting our session really with a focus on sustainability. I think a lot of us agree that this is a very important topic and it is also one of the themes of the days that we have in this conference. So I'm sure this will come back many, many times. And I hope that we can, uh, with all of us being here, uh, get a little bit closer to a sustainable solution. Um, I would invite people not to ask questions here because we, are, um, we will otherwise run out of time, but I would like to mention that there is a lounge where people can meet and chat informally, and if our keynote speakers are available to join people there, that would be great if people have more questions. Um, I would really like to thank again Lina Morani and Ingrid Dillo for being keynote speakers today, for Ron and in introducing our expo, and for all of us, uh, of all of you being here. So um, just to mention that uh, our next session will start at 11 and you can uh, check out the expo, expo exposition um, in the meantime on get yourself a coffee 
um, and join us uh, at 11 for the for the following session. So with this, I would like to close this opening and thank you all for being here.